Hello, everyone. We made it to episode three of the Gospel Tech Podcast. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about what do we do if we've realized the tech is not healthy. We talked last episode a little bit about what can we do to realize if it is or is not healthy. We talked about some ground rules we can use for that. Uh, go back and listen to that and then come to this one. And today we're talking about, all right, if we want something other than some of the digital tech that we use for amusement or entertainment or escapism, uh, what do we have? We're going to call these amazing tech uh, alternatives or even amazing analog adventures. Uh, but the idea is this is exciting stuff that digs into the passion and interest we have. Uh, if this is helpful for you, if you've been enjoying the Gospel Tech Podcast, would you please rate and review us through whatever platform you're listening to us on? They can be Google Play or the iTunes Music Store or Stitcher or whatever you're using. Uh, please go rate, review, share us with your friends or through social media because it does help us. We're a fledgling podcast. We're a new ministry and we really do want to be a helpful resource. Amazingly helpful is also when you guys go through social media, you contact us with your questions with um, how it's helping or, or areas you are still uh, wondering about and bring us into the conversation and the relationship. That's awesome and encouraging for us. And it also makes sure that our content is useful for you. Uh, looking forward to getting this conversation going. Thank you for being here. Here we go. Episode three. Welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast, a resource for parents who are feeling outpaced and overwhelmed as they raise children in a tech world. As an educator, parent, and tech user, I want to equip parents with the tools, resources, and confidence they need to raise kids who love God and use tech. Hello everyone, my name is Nathan Sutherland and this is Gospel Tech, where we are talking to parents about how we can raise healthy youth in a tech world, raising kids who love God and use tech. Uh, in a previous podcast, we talked about how do we know if our tech use is healthy and how do we know that with our family and with our young people. We went through a tool called the Reset, uh, where we look at things like their relationships and responsibilities, their emotions, their sleep, their enjoyment, and their time. Uh, and then we use that as our basis for a conversation, not out of fear, but out of the hope we have for our kids in Christ. And in this podcast, we are going to be discussing what do we do instead? Uh, we know that tech might be a problem in this one of five areas or these three of five areas, whatever it is for our kid or our family. But what do I do instead? So today we're going to be talking about very practically, what does that look like? What can I do instead? And I want to make sure at the very beginning of this conversation, we keep the focus on this is not us trying to fix our kids. Our kids are not a problem that we are going in and we're saying, hey, I've got all the answers. You've got all the issues. I'm now going to fix you and then you'll be more like me because I'm awesome. Instead, we're pointing them back to Christ. That's why this conversation is gospel tech, because we have to remember where the purpose of any of this comes from. Our kids have a designed purpose in Christ. One of the first verses we're going to talk today is Ephesians 2.10. We're reminded that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, our kids are not saved from the world where we go hide them in a bunker and we keep them safe. We actually believe that there's something much bigger than being safe and happy, but instead we are to uh, raise them up to walk in the way God is calling them or to Proverbs 22, 6 them to raise them up in the way they should go. Uh, and out of that, they are saved for the world, that they are actually called to works in this lifetime that God is going to equip them to do through his Holy Spirit. And that that is the idea that God is making his glory known despite the brokenness around us and that we are going to live through it but not of it, if that makes sense, right? We're in the world, but we're not of it is kind of the idea we're going. So this is not how can we fix our kid and get them to be perfect as we picture perfect, but how can we point our kids to the hope that's in Christ so they can fall more in love with this God who loves them and they can see a hope in this world, that they don't have to see the brokenness and go, man, there's absolutely nothing I can do about this, but they can go, man, I know someone who can. Uh, and that's why I'm not going to run to my tech for my hope and joy. That's why I'm not going to look to others for my purpose and value. I'm going to focus on the hope I have in Christ. And when they don't, we point them back to it. That's our opportunity as parents. Uh, we talked at the end of that podcast that there are uh, three specific things. When we look at, all right, I see unhealthy tech through the reset. I remove it. Uh, that was Dr. Victoria Dunkley's research where I remove it and I replace it with something healthier. A lot of times we hear, or we see, or really important brains out there tell us, well, the good stuff you should replace it with is basically just anything that doesn't plug in. Uh, I want to caution us on that. Again, that's more of the 
We're now rearranging the chairs to look like we, what we think it should look like. What we are doing is we're looking for specific unhealth, right? Lack of health. And then we're replacing it with healthy alternatives. And there's some amazing ones. They're going to fit three kind of parameters. These new replacement activities, these awesome alternatives, as I will call them, uh, are going to involve connecting. They're going to be face-to-face relationships because we were made in relationship from a God who is constantly in relationship with himself. Um, So we are going to make sure that we are connecting face-to-face. That's disciple-making happens in relationship. We are going to create, uh, which means we are going to be out there making something new, both because it happens at the pace of real life, and research says that's important, and because creation is part of what we were designed for. Yes, replicating um, humans so that we can be disciple makers of the people that we bring into the world, but also this idea that we are we are made in the image of a creative God who created us and then told us to go and reproduce ourselves and gave us these passions that we are unique and individual in, right? I care about different things than maybe people around me. Part of the reason I'm doing this podcast, right? I love seeing young people reach their own potential and I'm creating content for families to help us do that. That's a passion I've been given. That's not something I dreamed up one day. Um, So I'm now using that and creating out of it. We don't all have to create nonprofits, but whatever we do, and we'll walk through them today. There will be lots of creation opportunities. The third parameter is that it needs to inspire. Again, it needs to come down from a a place where we connect with this thing that we are making. We take pride and passion in it, not to reflect on ourselves and go, man, look at the great job I did, but we can reflect on the God who gave us that opportunity. Probably the best example I have off uh, on this is to inspire would be a buddy of mine who's a doctor and he is passionate about being a doctor. He did not dream that up one day. It is in line with his heart to see others. He specifically has a focus on uh, young kids with autism and he focuses and how can he support and love those families? How can he create resources for those families and how can he connect them with hope? Walking this incredibly hard road with these kids who are all over uh, the spectrum of autism from uh, highly communicative and just struggling socially to um, not and not, all right? And and how do we help love that family and then love those kids? And he is passionate about that. That is a desire that he now gets to do for a job, but it's also a mission, right? He's He is inspiring others because he's passionate about that and he's pursuing that with his faithful action in it and not allowing himself to be distracted. So that is our three. When we look at it, we go, all right, I've done the reset. We've got a problem. I'm replacing it with things that connect, create, and inspire. That's really important for us to have that as the background because if we don't, we just pick stuff and kind of throw it at our kids and hope it sticks, right? Like, here, try this thing I like, which is great. If you're passionate about something, introduce your kids to it. But often we find that we're actually just taking things we like and forcing those on our kids and saying, well, I don't like the way that tech is impacting you. Therefore, be more like me. And again, we're now trying to fix our kid. That isn't it. Our kid is unique. They're designed by God for a purpose. And the best thing we can do as parents is to equip them into that. Let's look at some actual, real, practical, tangible replacement activities. These are just major categories. This is not exhaustive. Uh, I'm going to run through a few of them to, to walk out. So I'm not just leaving you with category ideas, but actual practical ones. But here's just kind of an overview. We have things like art. We have board games. We have books. They can build stuff. Uh, they can join a club. They can design items and things in line with their passions. They can make music or participate in music. They can get in nature, get involved in a sport, uh, work with social stories. So not just independent hide in a whole stories, but stories that involve others, things like reading aloud, stories that are meant to engage um, or to be uh, enjoyed in a group. And uh, they can work because work is something we were designed to do. Adam did it in the garden. Uh, It is part of who we are, and it is part of what is going to be healthy. We're not created just for pure, quote-unquote, leisure. We are created to work, uh, but there's positive work that is in line with who God's made us, and there's work to prove ourselves and to gain our own value and to uh, trust in ourselves that is not so great. So when we look at that list... There's a lot there. I just want to start with art. And when I say art, it is really important to recognize that I am not just talking about flowers and our feelings and poetry, but there is art in the science of the world around us. And that is something that should draw us to awe. And that is the purpose of art is to make us amazed and to make us think outside of ourselves. So when we talk art, our God made the sunrise and the snowstorm, right? He made volcanoes. Uh, he's the one who made the the carbon atom and dark matter and sombrero galaxies. Like our God made everything from the ladybug insect to like the largest mammal you can imagine, right? We've got elephants or blue whales, I guess would be the largest mammal, but 
we uh we have massive just uh, mind-blowing amounts of of science and creation around us that is art it's things that are to bring us to the edge of awe and to make us wonder so when my son walked outside as a three-year-old we live in the northwest it's not sunny it's not clear very often at night he went out as a three-year-old and just stopped and goes whoa dad and i ran over i was like what bud he's like what are these and it was it had been so long from when he was kind of verbally processing uh, to when he could actually see stars again. It had been probably seven months of kind of cloud cover and he saw stars and he didn't know what they were and he wanted he wanted answers, right? He wanted to know what's going on. That is what art can do for us. Art can be um, a story. It certainly can be creating an image. Uh, it can just be conveying an emotion. And, and we're talking everything here from uh, this can be writing, this can be painting, this can be building, this can be theater, it can be singing and song, song creation or song delivery. Uh, but whatever we are involved in, we want to make sure that we are creating with the heart God gave us. Art. So I'm not saying that if you do art, you will somehow be a better person, you will be better equipped at life, that, um, that yeah, that art is somehow going to fix our kids. But if you have a kid... Uh, who is struggling to find a healthy balance, art is one way to convey them. And they don't have to do it with drawing on an iPad. They don't have to do it with painting. They don't have to do it with singing. Uh, Art is anything that they are expressing and creating narrative and story where they are now connecting. Remember, that's our first of the three parameters. Art will help us connect to people because that is the point of art, right? We are getting around the rules of communication and trying to convey the emotion and the theme, the central uh, uh, kind of focus of whatever we're thinking about. Um, And it's wonderfully powerful. Just read Psalms, right? And you're going to get art. Now, that's poetic art, but written by a warrior and a king, right? And a terrible person who knows what it's like to make horrible mistakes and have a God who still loves them. So uh, Psalms would be an example of kind of that done well. Um, if you're not into art or that doesn't go well, by the way, young kids generally love art in some variety. We just got to find it. Uh, it can be anything from finger paints to there's all sorts of resources out there we can find, right? Go Pinterest it for three minutes. Uh, but there are great resources. Books is the second. And I kind of cringe when I say books because as an alternative activity, if we just sell this as, Hey, you can't play your video games, but here's a book. Our kids will hate us. Okay, they will not. Most kids who love their technology to an unhealthy level do not love reading to the same level. Like most kids, there are a few, I've seen them and they're wonderful. But the average kid likes video games and technology and social media and Netflix because it's quick and it's easy and it's effortless and it's soothing. And I don't have to participate in this. I just sit back and kind of enjoy what's happening in front of me. Reading is hard. It doesn't do it for me. There's the in-between of an audio book. I think those are great. Reading out loud would be my number one, especially for younger kids. Uh, If you have an older kid... Uh, I think independent reading is wonderful. Audiobooks are a great in between for that. So if you have books you love, so my uh, six year old son really likes The Wild Robot, right? And that's a book that he enjoys that's got some adventure, but it's not too scary. We do the Narnia series out loud together, uh, and then he is learning to read on his own and is picking up really small books, right? Like a Daniel Tiger or something, where he can pick out the words himself and get that, that feeling of independence with it. Uh, Just because it's a book, though, and just because it isn't a screen that you're watching doesn't make it magically good. Please be aware of the content of the books your kids are reading. Uh, A wonderful resource for great books would be something like uh, Honey for the Child's Heart by Gladys Hunt. Uh, Sarah McKenzie is uh, the founder of the Read Aloud family and the Read Aloud revival, uh, and they do great resources for families if you're looking for, like, I don't even know what to read. Uh, Also, the app Goodreads, you don't download books through it, but it just is a way to track what you've read, what you like, and it kind of gives you suggestions for books in the same genres of what you're looking at and kind of is an algorithm-led process to if you just are out there floundering for new material for your kids. Uh, but you do need to know that there's there's content even in youth books, even in fairly safe youth books. So uh, if you are looking at uh, the Percy Jackson series, right, uh, as you follow that series in um, it progresses into its kind of off branch ones, you're going to run into things like transgender young people and Uh, you're going to be running into a lot of big social questions that come in along with the myths and the, and the stories, um, that are brought into the stories to, to kind of hit a modern audience. And you do need to be aware that a lot of that content is there and you need to be ready to have those conversations with your young people, uh, if you are handing them those books and letting them enter those worlds. But reading is amazing. Jesus worked through stories. I remember when I was in 
fourth grade, probably, I was given, I did not like reading. I did it. I could do it. It just wasn't fun for me. Uh, people gave me a lot of books and I didn't like them. A lot of the classics, I did, James and the Giant Peach did nothing for me. Uh, Narnia did nothing for me. And then someone gave me a book called Redwall. And it's about a bunch of talking mice who fight each other with swords. And that for some reason, like it clicked. So don't give up if the first book doesn't work. I had a young man in class. Um, and he came in with a really low reading level, was amazing at math, but literally arms crossed, telling me out loud in class, I hate this, this is dumb, when am I ever going to use this? And what we had as a kid who was excelling well beyond his grade level in math and then was well below his grade level in reading. So he's in eighth grade reading at a fifth grade level, uh, but doing math at a 10th grade level. And so, yeah, he's frustrated. No one likes to repeatedly do things they're bad at. Uh, and what we ended up finding was books that he enjoyed about engineering, science, and math. Uh, and these books were a lot of like the, the picture ones, like the book of the, the thing explainer book. Uh, where he could get into kind of the science and design of it, but with a vocab that was at a lower level. And then he read those with his dad and then he gained confidence and he ended up finishing at nearly an eighth grade level and was like so close to passing the state test. Uh, he had not even gotten near his uh, tier three marks and he almost got there. But uh, that's a cool story for me to look at as a as a parent, as an encourager of parents, and as a teacher saying, we didn't just take that kid and say, you need to read better. Here's a book I like. We find the things that they're passionate about. Um, so when we talk about books, it is a wonderful alternative. Um, I personally, so I gave up uh, video games eight years ago because I could not be healthy. Uh, it's a longer story, but basically the Lord convicted me that I was not trusting him for my hope and joy. I struggled with what to do with my free time. I wasn't gaming a ton, but I did have about 10 hours a week and I found board games. Now, again, much like books, if you just take board games and go, hey, kid who loves social media, play a board game with your friends. They're not going to love it, but I will tell you this. I ran a board game club at my school uh, and I would have 15 or so kids uh, show up every week and they would play board games and they would love it. And they're, some of them are athletes and some of them are theater kids and some of them are kids that don't have a single category to fit in. They just want a place to belong. The beautiful part about board games, they happen at the rate of real life. They involve a lot of problem solving. They require that we remember rules in our head because you can't just mash buttons if you forget what to do. And they are really, really hard to overplay by yourself. They're are, however, caveat again, board games that are unhealthy. There are board games with content that does not line up probably with what you expect from your kids. So don't just hand them any board game. But I would say for me, board games are amazing. Uh, family board games like Ticket to Ride, where you get train tickets around the country and you get points for completing journeys. Um, games like Carcassonne or Blockus or Quirkle. Quirkle is like a sort of like a multi-piece Tetris, um, or I guess it's more like Scrabble with shapes. But if you're into someone who doesn't like reading and they're more math-minded, a Quirkle would be great. Uh, BoardGameGeek.com is a nice spot you can go and just look up board games if you have questions. Uh, there are lots of amazing resources. Dice Tower is a, is an online YouTube resource where they review tons of games and show you how to play games and review different games. Um, and you can find someone maybe that you would like more, but that's just an idea to go. So board games, uh, you do need to be into them. Like you have to have someone who likes board games. You can't just hand your kid a box and say, do this. But I can tell you like my nieces and nephews, uh, I'm in a big family. I have four sisters and there's 20 grandchildren uh, amongst us. So my nieces and nephews are bountiful and I can get the 16 year old to sit down and play with me. And I can get the seven year olds to sit down and play with me. And they're going to be different games, but we're going to be able to get, uh, fun at the pace of real life. Uh, excuse me, board games can't move faster than real life. And in fact, they generally move much slower than real life because you have to take turns and stuff, right? There's a lot of positive research on um, some of the social improvements, the pro-social behavior. Uh, one of them, excuse me, um, coming from Dr. Galanti, uh, which is that you can improve frustration tolerance, meaning when things don't go right, how do you handle that? Uh, and that's really important because what we tend to do right now is distract ourselves from our problems. And if you can work on that through a board game, that's great. So I would strongly encourage board games. I hope to be able to cover this more in the future. I'm, I'm bringing in a friend uh, to come talk about kind of what are some awesome replacement things and how do you, how do you live life as a nerd in a tech free world or in a world that you have to moderate some of your tech. Uh, so if your kid's one of those people, I'm, I'm right there with them and we'll, we'll talk about that in the future. Uh, I just want to end with a couple here. I mentioned clubs 
clubs at your school. Uh, if you go to a public school, uh, you can actually start these with just go ask a teacher, hey, will you sponsor this club? There's paperwork. And then the, sometimes the school will even fund like buying stuff. It can be everything from chess club to board game clubs to theater clubs to music clubs. Uh, another nephew of mine got into a robotics club through his middle school that fed into the high school. And he literally got involved in effectively what is a DECA, a business uh, club but it's focused around robotics. So they have to do fundraising, then they have to do their own programming, and then they have to purchase all their own supplies, and they have to design everything themselves, and then they go to competitions with a robot they built. And that is his passion, but now in a friend group of similar interest and through a pretty regular schedule, right? It's not five days a week, but it's not once a month. It's a consistent thing he can go to and be a part of in addition to the sports he likes to play and those things that then allows him to be around the tech he likes without the unhealthy aspects. He recognized, man, my tech is a problem in these ways. I want to, I want to improve that. So I would encourage you strongly think about some club options. And if your school doesn't have any good ones, uh, find ways you can make one maybe and provide those for others. Again, we're looking for connecting, creating, and inspiring, and clubs help us do that. Sports are a frequent one that parents bring up. We've all uh, probably heard the positive research on how it helps us with things like sleep and anxiety because you went out and got exercise that day, right? The play 60 thing uh, through the NFL. We need exercise and sports are a great way to do that. They also are a great way to learn some basic coordination and overcoming adversity. And uh, they are they are wonderful. Even if you don't go pro in a sport, you can learn skills from it. Uh, I love sports. I would encourage parents. It, the point is not the sport, right? The point is the people who are in the sport. So you're doing this missional sporting. Uh, you are getting out of a distracting tech opportunity and you're getting into something that will allow you to invest in others. It is not about being on the best team. It is not about winning all the time. It is not about our kid making us look good and us reliving the glory days. Uh, we are actually trying to love them well. And the last thing I would say would be work. Um, when we were designed in the uh, Garden of Eden, God made us to work. Even in a perfect world, we were working. It just wasn't the toiling that it is, right? We're the, we're the backbreaking work that we talk about. Uh, work is important, and it's something that we can do uh, as an alternative to our, our gaming uh, or our social media or our Netflixing or our general escapism and finding hope in the wrong things. Uh, we are not to praise overworking, where now I'm working to find my purpose, and I'm working so that people will see how important I am and be impressed by me. But if I lovingly put my mind to something that I am passionate about, so when I do flint and iron, I'm working, and I'm using a passion that God has given me to see young people reach their full potential, and that is a beautiful kind of work. I do not do this 17 hours a day, seven days a week. I pick my work times, and I go and do it. My oldest son Loves working. That's very unusual, but he is a worker. So for that young man, right, we will go do yard work and that'll be like time together, him and I. We will go clip up branches that we chopped off the, the bushes in the back for the fall clipping and we will put them in and that like we'll do a half hour of that, right? And we will work together, which for us is important for him to, uh, to maintain equilibrium. And it's important to remember with our kids that work can be really positive. It doesn't mean just say, go get a job, right? The point isn't make money necessarily, unless in your life it is, uh, in this stage for your kid. It's a wonderful byproduct, but we do need to teach our kids just how do you work hard? What does that look like to be responsible for your work ethic? And that is something we can do instead of some of these tech activities. In fact, we can use tech to do that. They can have a passion where they make uh, a product they enjoy. There's a young man near me who's 15 now and he loves making chocolate. And so he makes chocolate in a commercial kitchen. He buys the hours for it and leases this space. And then he sells it in a local booth at the mall that his parents co-signed so that he could get. And he sells these chocolates that he makes that he then uses that money to pay for the things that he's passionate about. And that's wonderful, right? He may never be a chocolatier professionally, but it's a passion. It's an interest. And it's something that he is using that is allowing him to connect with people and to share something he loves to do. So whatever that is, uh, there's actually another young man near me who does that with Legos. He uh, collects busted up Lego sets, compiles them, and then resells them and actually borrowed, uh, not borrowed, he leases like a closet basically out in a city near me uh, where he does that on weekends. And that's what he does. And then he does like farmer's markets with it, right? And he makes some money and people get a good deal on Lego sets and he loves Legos and it's an interest passion for him. And 
that's kind of what we're talking about when we say work. It's not just go out and work your 12 hours or 10 hours a day and uh, that's what you need to do. That's what being an adult is. It's about training our kids. How do we work well? How do we work in light of who we've been made to be? So when we talk about alternative activities, I hope this has been encouraging for you. I hope you hear that there are tons of options that we didn't even get to cover today, uh, but that these are these are founded in who we are in Christ, not, man, I need to get this tech away and get my kids busy doing something else. That certainly we want to fill the gaps where tech was I guess being a distraction, we want to be able to fill those gaps, but we want to fill them in a way that glorifies God, that allows us to do the work we're called to do, that he prepared beforehand. And it's always going to have to do with connecting with people in face-to-face relationships, with creating because it's part of how our souls are wired and inspiring because when we pursue our passions in Christ, um, we are going to inspire people. They're going to see the joy that comes from that, not just because of the product, but because of the process. And we are all are a work in process, and we won't be done being worked on by God until we meet God face to face and become like Christ in the way we were designed to be. Uh, but between now and then, this is what we can do, right? We can give awesome, amazing alternatives to tech to our kids when tech is a distraction, when it is drawing them away from their full potential. Um, as we move forward in future conversations, we will we will dive a little bit deeper into some of these. I mentioned there's a there's a co-podcaster I'll be bringing in, and we'll be talking a little bit about kind of some of the nerd culture stuff. This is kind of unique that you actually have adults who are still in what would be considered kind of youthful thinking, right? Like that we love. I'm I'm a nerd myself, and I love things like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, right? So how do we how do we handle that so that we make sure it isn't a distraction? But is it possible that that actually can emphasize some of the creativity and amazement of God? I hope today was helpful for you. Uh, I really do hope that these alternative activities were encouraging, that as we look at the things we can do instead of uh, some of the unhealthy tech, that you feel like you have practical steps you can take to begin a conversation with your young person about, hey, here's what we see in your life um, as being unhealthy because it distracts you from the hope that you have in Christ and the person you're designed to be. We can see you gifted in certain areas and we want you to pursue that. And we believe these particular things are being uh, unhelpful in that. By the way, I want to give you full license. If you want to take a reset and apply that to something other than technology, like I don't know, friend groups or dating relationships or uh, activities they do outside of school, like you can do that. If anything is distracting them for their potential, right? We, we want to make sure that we are parenting well in those scenarios so that when they are adults, they can recognize, man, here's kind of the bumpers on this relationship with God that I've got. And I need to make sure that I'm lovingly uh, staying here because these these aren't rules that are arbitrary. These are rules that are made for my good. I was reminded today when uh, reading Mark chapter two that Jesus said, uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And this idea that God's rules are good. They are not arbitrary. They are not there to be just authoritative. They're there because he loves us and they're the best thing for us. That's what we're doing as parents. These are not ways we can punish and win against our kids. Uh, These are ways that we can help them see more fully the joy and the adventure that is available in life. And I hope you feel that way today. If not, please let me know. You can reach me through Nathan at flintandiron.org. You can go to Flint and Iron on Instagram or uh, Facebook. You can go to Sparking Purpose at Twitter. Um, and yeah, start the conversation. I would love to hear it. You can uh, DM me. I respond to all those messages personally. The emails come directly to me, and I would love to be a part of this conversation as we work together to raise healthy youth in a tech world, to raise kids who love God and who use tech.